Oh, I didn't see you there. Come join me, won't you? Thank you. Hello! Uh, I'm going to do another video now. Um, I've done a lot of reading when it comes to what makes music, um, just to try and find out why it's so passionate within me, and um, i got several ideas as to why. If you're interested, uh, you could also send your stories to me. Uh, I'm going to get that up in front. Um, and if you're interested in my particular story, then continue watching, please. I am going to first talk to you about uh, some books that I've been reading and um, find exactly how my story kind of comes together, but it's all related, so keep watching. First, let me put on my gloves. And I think prominently what made me want to do this particular video is um, a guy named Dave Grohl. He recently came out with an autobiography very well written and I highly recommend it. It helped open up um, and analyze, self-analyze and reflect a lot as to um, why music is so important to me. I mean, Lord knows I work a hell of a lot in another field and I actually have time to do these sorts of things for my leisure, uh, but uh, to get away from my job, music is like, so important. So important. My number one hobby by far. Although, there's also a lot of related fields. Uh, Dave Grohl, uh, who you might know from Foo Fighters and Nirvana, or uh, a previous uh, uh, punk band called um, Bain, Brain... No. Dane Bramage. <laughs> Dane Bramage. That's such a freaking great name. Um, he plays drums, and he plays drums a lot. Um, uh, he was going into his story and I've only got maybe about uh, a third of the way through with a lot of dog earring but something that I've noticed is um, the the way he talks about how music has influenced him since he was a kid and I've got several uh, similar inspirations and I thought I'd talk to you guys about that you guys get a chance to get to know me better uh, I get a chance to get to know myself better and uh, if you're interested, share your story so I get to know you better too. And maybe one day I'll have a chance to meet you. And maybe we could all meet Dave Grohl too. So reading the autobiography of David Grohl, um, I have to think about what my upbringing was uh, with uh, a dad who was an American, came to Canada, married my mom. He was a music teacher and my mom was a kindergarten teacher who eventually got into music teaching. So already a very solid musical foundation. Uh, an older brother who played music and sang music and a sister who also did music as well in high school. My dad was very classical music oriented. Uh, he uh, was able to write notations, uh, he sang in choirs, he was a conductor for all men Ukrainian choir, he was a conductor for a church choir. And my brother and I learned how to sing through him, sing soprano and eventually alto uh, with the ladies up in the choir loft. Uh, and I've, oh, as recent as 2018, sang in a choir loft with old ladies, Ukrainian masses, just because I could. It was fun. Um, the words haven't changed, the melodies really haven't changed, uh, and uh, fleshing out the, the sopranos and altos with a bar baritone or bass sounds good. Even some tenor lines kind of fleshes things out a little bit. Uh, old warbly voices. Um, I think that's the reason why my brother and I sound so similar too, vocally. My brother and I, however, uh, we vary quite differently in that he went into opera and I went into rock and roll. He went to the right and I took the left hand path. He eventually did musicals and learned how to play other instruments like, oh Jesus, saxophone, uh, French horn, uh, violin he played, or viola. Uh, he also played cello and he knew how to play the upright bass. I play the electric bass. He picked it up and he figured it out pretty darn fast. Uh, and um, the theory, I hated, I hated, and I was always under that shadow, and I eventually moved to guitar. 
He can also play guitar, but he doesn't rock out like I do. He, being older, was able to grasp concepts um, um, two years in advance than I could, really. Uh, despite exposure to similar elements, like uh, we had a baby grand piano, my dad made us uh, do music lessons and I hated it. With my brother uh, being so technical and just excelling at piano and singing and whatnot, uh, me doing everything kind of the hard way by listening by ear and figuring things out, um, sometimes have to uh, discover music theory just by doing my own research and figuring out notes, tones, semitones, keys, related majors and minors, and uh, that has been pretty cool. Um, this book is very helpful. Highly recommend it. Uh, talks about songwriting, entrainment, has uh, an appendix, talks about music theory, um, and it's newer research by a neuroscientist. Pretty cool stuff. Daniel J. Levitin. Check it out. He's actually written several books about music and neuroscience, so yeah, definitely check it out. He also starred in musicals, uh, as did my sister. Um, my dad and mom uh, wanted us to have that exposure, so um, Phantom of the Opera back in the 90s was popular. Les Miserables was very popular too. Uh, we learned everything. Yeah, I shouldn't ignore cats. I remember seeing that with my aunt. Uh, I must have been like five years old. And one of the actors come up to me. I could sing everything back and forth, um, pretty much all the parts. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, also exposure with long, um, for like four hours drives to the States and back. Uh, I know all of ABBA and Barry Manilow. And I kind of wish I didn't, but it's wedged in there like real good. Um, Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin brothers. I, I don't know very much country at all, but I know Larry Gatlin. Mom was exceptionally supportive. Uh, thank you, Mom. Uh, any kind of project that I needed to do or want to do, have friends over or go out and experiment and travel, she supported. Just like she supports my brother and my sister. Um, younger sister, she was fantastic uh, for support as well as a groupie. Um, she liked to hang out with my friends. But uh, several female artists were really important um, that were impactful. Um, I think either because of the radio and or because of my sister. Uh, Annie DeFranco, for example, Not a Pretty Girl. Seminal album. Uh, Tori Amos, um, Cornflake Girl. Um, there's uh, Lauren Hill, The Miseducation of, also fantastic album. Fleetwood Mac was on the radio for Q107 Classic Rock and um, I've listened to some of their albums. Uh, uh, Stevie Nicks is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Cranberries were on the radio all the time. Ace of Bass was on the radio all the time. Um, uh, we got a fast car. Um, uh, Tracy Chapman, she was on all the time. I remember in high school, um, back in the early 90s, uh, there was a huge explosion of grunge that happened. Uh, and some uh, pop punk that was becoming very popular. Metal was on the decline. Boy bands had taken over the radio. Uh, I had turned that off. Um, and uh, the underground scene in the 90s, I can't really recall very well at all because I never went downtown to check out clubs. I just, I couldn't. Um, and back in the late 80s, uh, the scene in Toronto um, was a lot of, uh, I think, punk. Uh, I don't know. I, w I never went to pubs and stuff. And I don't really like punk. Like, teenaged head. Um, and I really think that I didn't like punk because um, it was very simple and in your face and screaming and three chord specials. Um, it's like uh, Buddy Holly but screaming. That's what it sounded like to me and, and I didn't really like that at all. Um, with my dad and family um, learning how to read music and play instruments and such, um, the punk scene never really... It was more attitude than musicianship, let's put it that way. In high school, my family split. So instead of rebelling against anything, uh, I... Um, just 
explored music, uh, had fun with friends, had the entire basement, um, and had lots of equipment so I can just, you know, blast noise. And again, thank you very much, Mum. Uh, I remember in high school uh, mm, coming up with poetry because I heard Meatloaf and uh, his single I could do anything for love, but I won't do that. And that was just so horrible. I decided to write my own poetry, my own romance poetry. Uh, word clouds of various themes and then making it rhyme um, using a certain cadence that uh, flowed. And it was great. I got my stuff published in the newspaper. It was great. I could turn that into lyrics quite easily. Um, in fact, uh, I still study poetry. Uh, Poems in Context. Fantastic book. Absolutely great. But one thing that I'm thankful for is being in Canada because um, a lot of English literature has been studied to death. And if I'm going to come up with poetry and lyrics, compared to the greats of the United Kingdom as a nation, uh, I am uh, well, going to be pretty much out of my depth. So I was able to flourish and write my own stuff and not really have to you know, compare it if I had to study it in, uh, as an Englishman. So thank gosh for that. Uh, also, um, even if I needed to, the conceit of the English language and metaphor is a little underexplored. Because back in the day, English poetry, um, Ooh, geez, uh, had sponsors, and they didn't have, uh, like the Spanish did, uh, a huge uh, Baroque era of florid um, um, or opera or presentation. You had Shakespeare and sonnets and everything, but you never really had huge Eng English opera hits, did you? No. Um, you do have some pretty cool poets and poetry, but as I said, this stuff is a little underexplored. And of course, uh, there's also those uh, English uh, musicians that I listen to on the radio. English, Irish, Scottish, uh, Jethro Tull, uh, U2, Irish, uh, all using English as a language. Entrained me, made me listen to and be inspired to write music. Uh, for example, The Police was very popular and very poppy. Do 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 do, da 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 da, is all I want to say to you. The Moody Blues, uh, they uh, experimented with poetry, but they had their music. Um, uh, David Bowie, very popular. Uh, and this was just stuff off the radio because it had become so popular that uh, everyone just knew it. A uh, buddy of mine, David, was huge about the Beatles. Mind you, he came up, he's of Irish descent and uh, I'm Ukrainian and most of my friends are Ukrainian. So there is that integration, but everyone knows the Beatles. The Beatles have been on radio and television everywhere. It's old hat. Even the single stuff is just overdone. Um, you could say the same thing about Led Zeppelin, um, but I really like Led Zeppelin, so I don't understand that about me. And um, so formative in the American culture with the British invasions, uh, I think it's because Led Zeppelin was cool and the Beatles were more happy. Another thing uh, that came from Britain that I really appreciate, including the poetry, um, instead of, hey, hey, mama, see the way you groove, hey, hey, mama, see the way you groove, is Pink Floyd. Now, Pink Floyd is more uh, cerebral as opposed to visceral. It's uh, thinking music. It's beautifully composed and melded together and uh, Dark Side of the Moon, their best album, is still my number one favorite album of all time. Uh, just a great concept piece. Side A, about time. Side B, about money. And I think that was the very first band I ever got obsessed about. Like, I knew everything from the past. I've read books about it. Uh, I have bought books about it. Um, uh, photos, posters, pretty much every album in their disc discography. Um, I had gone shopping and found um, in uh, used bins like Omagoma and Adam Hart Mother and Saucers Full of Secrets. Like really digging into the early stuff. Uh, uh, Sid Barrett material. 
uh, Pink Floyd fans know exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, I kind of I lost it a little bit with Pink Floyd. Just really obsessed. So uh, listening to Q107 was a fantastic education for uh, classic rock, but there was also 102.1 The Edge in Toronto, and they had up-and-coming acts, and that was pretty cool. Listening and hearing what's popular. Uh, Sloan, for example, uh, from Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick, one or the other. Uh, Bush X, that was pretty good. Uh, single artist, fantastic. Uh, Dave Matthews Band, Oh my god, so dark and mysterious. Whew. Um, the Bare Naked Ladies, Guns N' Roses, uh, Radiohead, Bon Jovi, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, the Canadian band The Tragically Hip. Uh, I pretty much know everything from that catalog. Um, the Cranberries. There were certain CDs that I picked up uh, and been exposed to over and over again, um, either through family or close-knit friends. Uh, Barb Marley, uh, The Doors came out with a double album, um, Neil Young, um, Santana, uh, things that I discovered and uh, had a huge influence on me because I was able to play a lot of it on guitar and yeah, it was very formative. Uh, summer campfires, uh, playing Tragically Hip and playing Neil Young on guitar, uh, just magic. The things that were happening in the 90s that helped um, create my musicianship, uh, helped mold me, um, were the huge acts that were coming up. So Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, Radiohead, um, Stone Temple Pilots, um, Nirvana. Although I have to say, I'm, I was never really a Nirvana fan. It was everywhere all at once, and the uh, music was sad and twisted. Um, it was uncomfortable to listen to. I was into uh, things like Blind Melon, happy up-tempo music, uh, a lot of U2 uh, with the, the long airy notes and a rockin' beat, a groove. Yeah. Our Lady Peace. Our Lady Peace and I Mother Earth came out around the same time and I always got those two conflated. Uh, Our Lady Peace very rockin' with crazy vocals, and saw them for New Year's at Mount Lastman Square, uh, and I Mother Earth, which was very, very groove-oriented with crazy videos, and ah, oh, I still listen to them this day. Uh, other acts that were super popular at the time, um, Metallica, Thrash Metal, Megadeth, uh, British Metal. Um, I got into Judas Priest pretty late, but uh, Iron Maiden, one thing that I should say um, about Metallica is uh, Master of Puppets. That was a freaking great album. I got introduced to Master of Puppets way late. Like, I should have been introduced to Master of Puppets and then Justice for All. Uh, and then the Black Album. Um, although the Black Album was pretty commercially successful, so I don't think I could have, I could have avoided that one. Now this is where I should introduce Andy. Uh, he is the son of my dad's best friend who is also into classical music and as a result he is also a musician and we've actually been in a band together. Andy introduced me to a lot of metal. Um, he and Theo, I remember being over at Theo's place and he had a small amplifier and I taught him uh, some guitar chords that he was able to crunch and completely enlivened by the metal. But it was really Andy, uh, who I had experienced the most contact with, uh, that would have me listen to um, One by Metallica, that would have me listen to um, The Wasted Years by Iron Maiden. That's such a great tune, I sang that at karaoke recently. Uh, Black Sabbath also kind of fits in that vein too, uh, with British metal. Um, However, they have a huge arc, and it's pretty complicated. I know a lot from that catalog. Uh, and back then, ACDC, of course. Yeah, you can't neglect ACDC. Just uh, simple, simple rocking out stadium rock tunes. Um, that was fun. Back in black. Uh, Pearl Jam also came out around that time, uh, in the early 90s. 
Um, really enjoyed them. Really, really enjoyed them. 1991. I remember that summer so well. Um, Soundgarden and Chris Cornell. And Alice in Chains as well. Although, I have to admit, I didn't know very much Alice in Chains until later. And, ah, another tragedy. Um, I could sing them, and I love playing that music. And uh, although I really appreciate all that metal, um, there's several genres of it that never really stuck to me. Uh, it started to branch out into death metal and um, black metal and and eventually into new metal and I can't listen to new metal. I always appreciated hard rock. Uh, hard rock was something that did stick to me. Um, so although I didn't quite like the Guns N' Roses scene because it was too uh, LA sleazy, I did appreciate uh, a lot of Slash, a lot of the stuff that went after Guns N' Roses. Um, Apocalyptic Love, um, fantastic album, uh, Slash and the Co-Conspirators. Um, there is also uh, Shinedown, Buck Cherry, um, Clutch, and Danko Jones, uh, a Toronto native. I've seen him live and he took me uh, to see him and that was fantastic. Shook his hand afterwards. Really cool guy. Uh, turns out he also has a podcast. I just found that out last week. It's freaking great. Also, back in those days was a lot of uh, hip hop that was starting to come out. Uh, Aerosmith um, got together with. Ooh, who did they get together with? Uh, a lot of it, I think, had to do with the fact that Aerosmith was so huge at that time. Uh, and they did a fusion called Walk This Way. Uh, it just was everywhere. Uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air was on TV. Uh, Fresh Prince, uh, he became a household name. Um, Maestro Fresh Wes. God, I want to listen to that so bad. Maestro Fresh Wes. He was huge in Toronto. Special shout out to uh, Jeff Martin and the Tea Party. Uh, I've seen him twice. And back then, it was very influential. Uh, he occupies this dark mysterious corner of rock and roll and it's very creative. A uh, good friend of mine, uh, Der, he uh, played classical piano. Uh, he also had tattoos and a shaved head. <laughs> um, he tried to introduce me to Skinny Puppy and couldn't do it. But he did introduce me to Tool and that was freaking incredible. I'm a huge Tool fan now. Uh, and a perfect circle and I've listened to some of uh, Maynard's single stuff too. Uh, another friend of mine by the name of Zinn, uh, he introduced me to Johnny Cash and it's country and I don't like country but Johnny Cash's story is incredible. So yeah, hats off to him. He also introduced me to Fast Electronica. I shouldn't really say that I don't know any country. Um, aside from Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin Brothers, which is pretty old, Waylon Jennings from Dukes of Hazard was good. The Eagles, Rock and Country, Blue Rodeo, Canadian Country, but not New Country, like nothing of New Country. Shania Twain, sorry, no. Zinn also introduced me to Rage Against the Machine, and so when Soundgarden broke up and Chris Cornell went to Audio Slave, uh, that was quite a twist. That was a fusion. A Q107 um, classic rock in Toronto was a pretty cool education. Uh, working at Brews Retail and singing into the microphone. But they also played a lot of weird stuff too, which I didn't quite like. I say I really like groove oriented stuff, but uh, a couple of important bands that I never liked at all that were very groove oriented was The Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan. And I didn't really like them. It just never clicked with me. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not from that era. I did learn a lot though. Uh, they introduced me to Eric Clapton, although I much prefer Cream, that, that version of Eric Clapton because his later stuff is just really toned down. Oh, and Jimi Hendrix, of course. I mean, you can't go without Jimi Hendrix. April Wine, fantastic. The Guess Who, fantastic. Um, I was able to learn about stuff on the radio and then sing at karaoke. 
I did that like twice a week. It was so much fun. And then advertise, uh, making up little flyers and, and posters and, and putting them on, word of mouth, talking, name dropping, and uh, I eventually learned how to do my own marketing. It was all covers uh, originally with a band called Smoke and Mirrors, just me and a buddy named Tom. Um, then I was able to do uh, bands from uh, two guys that I met doing Jesus Christ Superstar. We called ourselves Random Peace. We did the downtown circuit, uh, learned the importance of emailing, getting fans, uh, printing, again, flyers and posters and posting it up and going from place to place. Um, working a lot and going to school a lot. Girls, 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 and no sleep. Someone that really kind of pushed me to do research and to learn a lot of the uh, late great classic rock stuff was Bo. Uh, he was drumming for The Thirst and he pushed me to do a lot of bands that I wouldn't have really considered doing. By this point it was already the early 2000s so I wanted to do things like um, Shinedown but he was pushing more towards to you know stay before 1987 and anything before 1987 was like his jam. So uh, because of that preoccupation with a lot of classic rock music uh, I started to ignore a lot of the things that were going out and missed out on a lot of things that were going on. Um, I really liked uh, Perry Farrell and, and Jane's Addiction. Um, really, really popular music. Um, I was very late into Coheed and Cambria. I was very late into Mars Volta. But by the time I left The Thirst, these were new names to me. So I just absorbed everything. Alexis on Fire, System of a Down, uh, Jeez. Yeah, a couple of bands later, uh, these guys were introducing me to a whole bunch of their stuff um, by um, uh, burning them and sending me copies. Toxicity of a city, a city. Uh, also in the 2000s, I got into Trance Electronica, if you can believe that. Uh, Paul Oakenfold, um, stuff from Kazan Tip, Ibiza. Uh, all that trans electronica was fantastic, and it ha all had to do because of percussion. Uh, and also the music scene. Uh, friends of mine would be going to raves and doing some weird drugs, and I never did because I had a relationship at that time, so she kind of kept me clean. But uh, it was a lot of fun going to these places and seeing everyone just... And the music was kind of repetitive and boring, and you kind of needed the drugs for that sort of thing, but like any kind of music scene, like... Oh, jeez. Uh, punk rock, uh, Iggy Pop, you have to go through a bit of a culture change, a, a nourishing phase, uh, a cocoon phase before the music actually turns into something really, really great. Um, if you like that early phase where it's raw and half-baked and undeveloped and fresh and new and divergent, then oh, that's good for you. But I like music that's been kind of uh, polished and refined and uh, mixed well and thought out and uh, uh, has some planning in it. Uh, Trans Electron has got that ambience that's overarching everything, soft vocals, nice long uh, airiness with the whole part of the, uh, the dynamics of the drums, how it rises and falls, how it's dynamic, uh, how people um, start to dress and have fun with that sort of thing. It became its own culture, kind of like hip hop was its own culture. And uh, going to see bands live, that is always a huge impact because that's pretty formative. Um, Corrosion of Conformity, saw them. Oh my God, fantastic. I just downloaded a couple of their albums that I should have downloaded years ago. And I guess I'm going to be leaving off at that. The fire's dying down. Um, seeing shows, friend exposure, radio exposure, being able to figure out and having the opportunity to uh, play tunes and then doing them yourself in pubs. Formative experiences. And uh, with that, I've actually started to do a little bit of uh, reading myself about how I can now promote my own particular kind of music, the stuff that I like to play, the stuff that I've been creating and recording and hopefully producing um, on stage uh, wherever I go. Um, I wouldn't mind going back to Toronto and doing a few shows. I wouldn't mind doing some shows here in Athabasca. Wherever there's a stage, uh, wherever people will have me, even if it's a pub, coming up with the Adrian brand. Um, 
I'm going to be promoting this, another reason why I'm doing these videos. And so, if you like these videos and you want to be a fan, then let me know. It'd be nice to get in touch with people. Uh, I already have some people who know about my videos and uh, have been uh, liking. Uh, they've been sending me little comments. I plan to do a lot more and put this stuff up on YouTube. So, see you there. And uh, maybe after a few years and a few million dollars, I too can write an autobiography.